host here for any technical issues you experience, as well as any questions that you'd like to share with the presenter. We'll share these questions towards the end of the session with Dr. Carpenter. The session uses auto captioning. While these captions are not going to be exact, and I've just been informed it does an interesting thing with my last name, um, we hope that they can improve accessibility for all attendees. To activate those, what you need to do is look for the option in your Zoom toolbar. Um, on mine, it's at the bottom. I'm not sure where it is on yours. Um, that says live transcript. And then you can select either subtitles or the full transcript, and you'll get that in, the, in a sidebar. Um, if you're intending to claim professional development credit through SC Endeavors for early educators um, for attending this, please complete the submission form that I have already shared um, in the chat box before the end of the session. It's essential to have that information needed to process your credits. Remember that you need to attend the session for its full one hour duration in order to receive the credit. You should be, I'm double checking now, um, that link is there in the chat box um, as of 11 a.m. Um, let's see. At this point, I'm, I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Laura Carpenter as our presenter. She is a professor of pediatrics and psychiatry at the Medical University in South Carolina. As it notes on her slide, and I was gonna mention this even if it didn't, she is also the training director for the South Carolina LEND program, um, which is an effort that I have the pleasure of closely collaborating with Dr. Carpenter and others. Um, Dr. Carpenter is a very well-respected researcher in the area of autism. She has a whole host of other skills clinically and educationally, and I will leave it to her to point out any other things that she'd like to at this point. Um, and really what I wanna do is turn it over to Dr. Carpenter so that we can get the great information that she's about to present. Dr. Carpenter. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm going to be talking about autism in school age children. Oh, let me see. Okay. Um, and we'll be going through the criteria, um, talking about um, comorbidities, and um, we'll finish with evidence based treatments and complementary and alternative medicine treatments for autism. Um, so let me just start with a quick note about person first language. So um, as most of you have been trained, we usually use person first language when we're talking about um, people with autism. So we'll say this is a child with autism, this is an adult with autism. This is sort of the way we use other disease. This is how we refer to other diseases. So you wouldn't say this is a cancerous child, you would say this is a child with cancer. Um, I think it's important for everyone working in the autism world to know that there is a uh, movement within the autistic community to use identity first language, um, which basically recognizes that autism is an integral part of that person's identity, not a party, should change that. Um, but this is a quote that, um, from, that I found online that I thought was wonderful. Um, the person said, these are not qualities or conditions that I have, they are part of who I am. Being autistic does not subtract from my value, worth, or dignity as a person. Being autistic does not diminish other parts of my identity. So I think, you know, when you're working with families and particularly as you get into school age and adolescence, it's really just important to listen to how the family and the person refers to themselves and respect the choices that they make. In this talk, you will hear me defaulting to person first language. Um, so I think, you know, as everyone here probably knows, um, in 2013, we made a shift um, in how we think about autism from having sort of various disorders on the autism spectrum, PDD, autism, Asperger's, CDD, and also RETS, um, and sort of collapsing them all into one umbrella diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, which I think has done a lot for improving access to care um, for people with, um, with autism. I think we've lost something too. Too, um, particularly in terms of the diagnosis of Asperger's disorder, where I do think it describes a certain kind of segment of people on the spectrum. Um, particularly, I think kids that get diagnosed um, during school age years um, often would have met that old kind of diagnostic criteria for Asperger's disorder. Um, autism is comprised of two distinct categories of behaviors, social communication problems and restricted repetitive behaviors, and they both have to be there in order to make the diagnosis. 
I think it's important to remember that autism is just a syndrome. So a syndrome is a collection of symptoms that occur together without a known cause. But we've made a lot of progress um, in our understanding of autism. So way back um, when autism was first included in the DSM, we basically based the definition on observations of multiple patients, which meant that people kind of sat around in a room and said, well, I think people with autism make core eye contact. And someone else said, well, I think people with autism have repetitive motor movements and um, kind of um, described it that way. And what's changed in our DSM-5 conceptualization of autism is that we've been able to use these incredibly large data sets, um, particularly using ADOS and ADIR data to really understand what the core symptoms of autism are. And so it is just a syndrome, um, but I think that we're coming closer to figuring out what the important characteristics are that make someone autistic. Um, so, you know, I think it's important to remember, just like any other psychiatric disorder, autism exists on many continuums. Um, so cognitive functioning, there are people um, with autism who have cognitive skills that fall um, 40 or below, and there are people who have cognitive skills that are gifted. Um, and, and that's true of any disorder, right? If you think about depression or anxiety, you can see depression in, or anxiety in gifted people, and you can see depression or anxiety in people with intellectual disabilities. So autism is no different. Um, what is, oh. Okay, sorry. Um, the social deficits in autism also exist on a continuum. So we have some people who are incredibly aloof, um, people who really aren't interested in interacting with other people, very content on their own. Um, but at the other end of the continuum, you have this group that Lorna Wing called the active but odd group. These are the people that desperately want social interaction, um, but don't always know how to smoothly execute that interaction. The restricted repetitive behaviors are so um, varied as well. Um, so I have patients where their restricted repetitive behaviors are all consuming and it's really the focus of treatment for them. Um, you know, whether it's a sensory issue that really prevents them from being able to go out in public because of sensitivity to noise or lights or textures, um, whether it's an obsessive interest um, or a preoccupation with some kind of visual input. Some of my patients really um, have a difficulty participating in daily life because of their RBs. I have lots of other patients who their RBs are there and you can certainly kind of put check the boxes to say, yep, they're kind of obsessed with cars and yeah, they seem sensitive to noise, but that's not what gets in the way for them. That's not the functional impairment and it's nothing that we would ever treat. And then finally, I think it's important to remember that neurotypical people fall on a spectrum as well, right? So you know, there are some people out there who have no autism related symptoms and there are some people out there who have every autism related symptom that you can think of. And most of us are sort of scattered somewhere along that continuum. And, you know, when we think about autism, particularly the lay public, they think of it as you either have it or you don't, like being pregnant. You take a pregnancy test, you are either pregnant or you are not, there's no continuum. Psychiatric disorders are not like that. Um, they exist on a spectrum. Um, and what we're really doing is drawing an artificial line in the sand and saying people on this side have autism and people on this side don't have autism, um, which is not very satisfying when you have people who fall right on that line and they sort of have some symptoms of autism and they sort of have some symptoms that aren't. And I think when you're talking about um, evaluating children um, who are school aged for concerns for autism, you're gonna find a lot of kids who fall in that borderline um, between autism and non-autism. Um, so just a quick reminder, I know uh, most people here are probably familiar with the diagnostic criteria for autism, but the social communication skills, you have to have three criteria of deficits, three areas of deficit. So social emotional reciprocity, you can think of as like the give and take of social interaction. Nonverbal communication, this is both the ability to express oneself non-verbally as well as the ability to understand the environment and to understand non-verbal communication of other people. Um, 
And so people with autism often, you know, their families will say like, oh, I got him this gift and he didn't even seem to care. And the fact is that sometimes we just don't know what that person is feeling because they're not communicating their, um, their emotions to us real well. Um, and at the same time, that person with autism might also have difficulty picking up on those nonverbal cues. Um, so they might, you know, make an a a social approach to someone that's very appropriate, but it's not at the right time. You know, they don't pick up on the cues that that person is upset or frustrated or doing something else. Um, and, you know, those nonverbal cues come from all parts of the environment. It's the situation, it's the eye contact, it's the emotional expressions, it's the body posture. Um, and this can be really difficult for people with autism to learn. Um, if it doesn't sort of come naturally. And then finally, you see difficulty with social relationships. And I think it's important to remember that people with autism have friends. Most people with autism have friends, right? Um, it's not a lack of social relationships, but there's a different quality, quality to the social relationships that you often see in autism. So um, many of social relationships will focus on shared interests. So as long as the shared interests between the two people sort of align, everything is fine. Um, but as soon as they start to sort of diverge, then the person with autism often doesn't see the point in continuing that relationship. Um, also lots of difficulty understanding social rules, particularly those governing relationships. So um, calling everyone your friend and not being able to distinguish the difference between someone who is your close close friend and someone that you can sort of disclose personal information to and someone who's just an acquaintance that you might want to be a little bit more guarded with. Um, and then finally, we see um, in autism a lot of preference for relationships with either older or younger children, um, which can definitely cause problems in both ends of the spectrum, right? So if you have a 45-year-old person who wants to be friends with a toddler, it's just it's not a good idea. It's gonna get that person into trouble. Um, and at the same time, if you have an 11 year old who wants to be friends with a 45 year old, also um, lots of room for difficulty. And then we also have the restricted repetitive behaviors that are a hallmark of autism. And um, you have to have two out of four of these categories. So the first category of repetitive behaviors is sort of the largest. It's pretty unusual for someone to have autism and not have a repetitive behavior. So this can include the repetitive speech that we see in autism, like echoing things or saying the same thing over and over, the classic repetitive motor movements, the hand flapping, the spinning, the tensing, repetitive use of objects. Um, these are often um, things that people with autism do when they're anxious. And so in the past, we might have tried to squelch this repetitive behavior, but now I think there's more of a recognition that if we squelch this repetitive behavior, we might be um, sort of taking away a person's coping skills. Um, and so usually in treatment, unless it's getting in the way of something that the person wants to do in their lives, repetitive behaviors are not as concerning. The rigid adherence to routines and rituals, the next category, um, is one of the most problematic areas, I think, um, in school-age kids with autism. So these are the extreme negative changes, extreme reactions to small changes. You know, um, new bus driver, entire day is ruined. Um, that autistic stickiness, not being able to move on from one thing to the next. I just had a little girl um, in my clinic and, um, you know, we asked her to write the beginning of the alphabet and she could not move on until she finished the entire alphabet. And when she did, she was fine. Um, but you can see how something like that would really get in the way in the classroom. Um, intense interests, these can be one of the incredible gifts in autism. So people with autism often have either unusual interests or an excessive focus on a specific topic. Um, and that can lead to a high le level of mastery in that area. I think there are many adults with autism who have created entire very successful careers around their intense interests. And then finally, the category of sensory difficulties. I think if you talk to adults with autism, this is the category that they will describe as being um, sort of the most painful for them. Um, so this is either negative reactions to um, either sight, sound, smell, texture, movement, or excessive seeking out of, those, of that sensory input. And, um, when you, um, you know, 
when you talk to someone with autism, they'll often talk about these sensory differences as being one of the most difficult symptoms for them to manage personally. Um, tensing, is this like kind of tensing your body or holding it in funny postures? That was a question in the chat. Okay. So I want to talk about um, common profiles for later identification of autism. And I'm talking about kids that are identified after six years of age. So we know that in South Carolina, our average age of diagnosis is four. We also know that we can accurately diagnose autism as young as 15 months. Um, but unfortunately, there is this group of kids who come in later for various reasons that I'm going to talk about who don't have autism diagnoses until they're at school age teenagers and, and certainly even adults. So I think one category is the mildly impaired child, right? The symptoms have always been there. When you look back, yep, yeah, they, yes, they hand flapped. And yes, you know, they kind of were more interested in objects than people, but it's not until the social world becomes more complex that the mildly impaired child starts to have more difficulty. And I've noticed that this seems to happen at the transition points, right? As the child goes into kindergarten, as they go into middle school, as they go into high school, that's when these kids tend to come into my clinic. There's another category um, that I call the passive child. Girls often fall into this category. And we're gonna talk about that more in just a second. These are the sweet kids. They have no behavioral challenges. They have no bell ringer symptoms. So a bell ringer symptom is something that is absolutely gonna bring you into my clinic. If you are flapping your hands, you will end up in an autism clinic, no matter how good your social skills are. Um, but when you kind of scrape away the sweet, you know, passive kind of characteristics, the autism symptoms are often pretty clear. Um, kids with severe to profound cognitive delays are really challenging to identify early. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about how to make that differential diagnosis um, a little bit later in the talk. Um, but at some point, it's very difficult to, to figure out if the child is just globally delayed or whether their social and communication skills are really lagging behind their skills in other areas. Um, and so I think that's a group that probably getting a diagnosis much before four is, is, not, um, is not feasible and maybe even six um, is pretty normal. Um, so the next group of kids are those who either have significant medical complexity or significant psychosocial complexity, kids who have been in treatment for cancer, kids who have been in and out of foster care, kids who have severe seizures. I think early on, those social deficits are noted and those atypical behaviors are noted, but people feel like, oh, this is because the child hasn't had a chance to be around other kids because of their medical condition, or they've just been in and out of foster care so much, and that's why they have these symptoms. These kids, I almost always see around five or six. And so it's when they start school, usually by then the medical concerns have started to decrease a little bit and the autism behaviors are still there. And then finally, I think the most challenging type of case that we see in our clinic is or the kids that I call the diagnostic whirlwind. They are the kids that have had severe behavioral challenges from an early age, and they've had many diagnoses by the time they come to see us. Um, so they have been diagnosed with ODD, ADHD, OCD, anxiety, um, tics. Many times these kids have had really good treatments. They've been in PCIT, they've been given medicines for ADHD and the behaviors are persisting. And at that point, when you start to look back, you see that, wow, these social deficits were really there from a very early age. And that um, cluster of symptoms really seems to fall better under the autism spectrum than under all these other diagnoses that have kind of been whirling around for this child. Okay, I think later diagnosis is really challenging. Um, and you know, one issue is that when you're evaluating a two-year-old, you basically have three choices that you can kind of make in, in a diagnosis. You can say that the child is typically developing and has no concerns, they have global developmental delay, or they have autism. By the time you get up to age seven, wow, there are so many things that can be going on. Is this a psychiatric problem? Is this um, just sort of a global developmental delay? Um, you know, there's just so many options out there that you need to assess and rule out at the same time that you're assessing autism. 
Um, there is this concept called the masking, and the idea is that as people with autism get older, they learn how to mimic the gestures and conversational styles of others. And I definitely have seen this in some patients where the first time you meet them, everything seems fine. Um, you can have a conversation with them, they make eye contact with you, and it's not until you meet them several times that you realize, wow, we're having the same interaction over and over, and this person is relying on the same sort of um, you know, kind of um, standard responses, the same questions every single time that I talk to them. I think diagnosis in girls is really tough. You know, when you learn about autism, when you read a textbook about autism, you're reading a textbook about boys um, because, you know, we know that about two thirds of the kids on the spectrum are boys. And so, you know, when you read about obsessions in autism, what is the example? obsession with trains, obsession with vehicles, obsession with baseball statistics, you're not going to see that in girls as much. Um, you know, you're going to see things like an obsession with Disney princesses. And I think at first, when people see a girl who loves Disney princesses, they think it's adorable and they don't think of it as an autism symptom. I also have seen um, a huge bias in people assuming that when girls don't interact, it's because they're shy. Um, so people are basically attributing their difficulties to anxiety um, rather than considering that it might be a skill deficit. That's why they're not interacting. And then the other um, challenge I think we have is that kids that are coming in for school age diagnoses these days have often had a prior evaluation for autism when they were younger. Um, and so, you know, one of the amazing things that we have learned from the infant sibling research. So this is, this is research done in this very high risk group of, of infants that have older siblings with autism. So we know that about 20% of those babies will go on to develop autism. And um, the infant sibling researchers will evaluate those babies at three months, six months, nine months, et cetera. Well, now those babies are old. Now those infant siblings, the oldest cohorts, they're getting into late childhood. And what they found is that there is a group of kids who have been serially evaluated all along. They got great gold standard evaluations at some of our best diagnostic clinics in our country that did not meet criteria for autism at three. And then at eight, they do meet a criteria for autism. And so I think what happens is, you know, a clinician will, or a teacher will be like, have you ever considered autism? And the parent will be like, oh no, we went to MUSC and they said that they didn't have autism. And that's sort of shuts the whole um, dialogue down. Um, but actually um, it is possible that that person has autism and that the symptoms were just so mild early on that it, the diagnosis didn't make sense. But now that they've gotten older, the social world has become more complex. There's so much more expected of them, right? You have to be able to, when you're in fourth grade, fifth grade, your social world is very, very complex. You have to be able to read other people, understand other people's intentions. And that's where some of these kids start to have difficulty. So just as an aside, when I do rule out diagnoses in young kids now, I often will talk to parents about this, that you know, if they don't meet criteria now, but if you have concerns in a few years, please come back and see me because this is certainly a possibility. Okay, so these are some of the differential diagnoses that we're gonna be looking at when we're evaluating a, um, a school-age child with autism. And so, um, this first cluster of, of disorders, social phobia, selective mutism, ADHD, all of these um, disorders have social deficits, right? Um, difficulty maintaining friendships, difficulty communicating with other people. I think the key when you're looking at these differential diagnoses are the restricted repetitive behaviors. Kids with ADHD, selective mutism, social phobia are not going to have those RRBs. And sometimes you have to look really carefully. Sometimes the RRBs are a little bit subtle, but they're there. Um, the next two group, the next two kind of differential diagnoses that we're gonna be looking at um, in school age assessment of autism are either an emerging thought disorder, like an emerging psychosis or a mood disorder. And so the big um, priority here is really understanding the child's developmental history. So asking the parent, can you bring in notes from preschool? Can you bring in, you know, um, 
evaluations that the child had, you know, between zero and five, and then really focusing on that period of time between four and five years of age. If everything was wonderful between four and five, the child was interacting, they had no repetitive behaviors. And now at 12, you're seeing a child who has flat affect and doesn't make eye contact and is preoccupied with the end of the world. Um, I think we're looking at an evolving um, psychiatric problem and not a developmental disability. In autism, even if we can't diagnose the disorder early, the symptoms have always been there. That's what's really important to remember that the, the developmental history will be consistent with that autism. Um, the next three, intellectual disability, Tourette syndrome and OCD are complicated. So I'm gonna go through separate slides on each of those. But one thing that I, um, oh, it's a little bit cut off here, but one thing I wanted to point out is that it's not always a differential, right? You can have selective mutism and autism. It's not common. Um, you certainly can have ADHD and autism or ODD and autism. So it's not always a differential diagnosis. Sometimes you're looking at comorbid diagnoses, but getting the diagnosis right is important because if we're treating this child for ADHD and they actually have autism, we're missing a huge part of the picture of what's going to help this child. Okay, so yeah, these. Okay. So um, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but when we're trying to figure out like the autism in, in people with kind of severe to profound intellectual disabilities, it's a little easier in kids with mild intellectual disabilities, but in severe to profound, what you need to do is really look at oh, mental ages and where that child is falling in terms of their social communication skills versus their skills in other areas. So if this is a child that is toilet trained and can climb on playground equipment and can feed themselves and yet they don't look others in the face and they don't play with their peers. Wow, that's sounding a lot like autism. But if you know they don't look others in the face and they don't um, play with their peers and they're not walking yet even though they're four and um, you know they don't have object permanence, um, then it's starting to sound a little bit like more of a global um, disability rather than something specific to autism. And I think it's interesting to look at some of the really early social milestones that babies typically hit. So, you know, um, two month olds pay attention to people's faces and smile at them. Five month olds can imitate play. Six month olds know the difference between a stranger and someone familiar to them and can recognize their name and respond to other people's emotions. So I think that's helpful when you're thinking like, maybe this is just a global developmental delay. It's helpful to remember how social these little infants can be. Okay, tics versus stereotypes. This, it can be really tough. Um, and I um, put together this table using um, information that I found in the article that's referenced on the slide. So here's what I think the useful distinctions are. Ticks tend to follow a pretty similar course in most people. So they tend to onset between age five and seven. They tend to start with blinking, eye blinking, throat clearing, and then move on to other movements like jerking. They tend to be very quick and short. And this is really important before engaging in a tick, people with Tourette's or tick disorders will experience a premonitory urge. They'll feel like they have to do it. It's like you need to sneeze and you can't inhibit it or you need to cough and you can hold it back for a little while, but eventually that cough has to come out. Um, and that person often will report discomfort or distress associated with their technique, with their tick. So they have to get it out. Um, so let's contrast that with the stereotype movements that we see in autism, the hand flapping, the, um, the rocking, the spinning, the bouncing, the tensing. Those movements tend to start very early, usually before age two, um, and they tend to be rhythmic rather than quick onset, quick offset, um, and prolonged. Um, and here's a key, people with autism like their stereotypies. It's often a way to cope with boredom or cope with stress um, or just feels good. Um, and I don't think anyone with tics describes their tics as feeling good. This differential is really important um, because autistic stereotypies um, don't tend to respond to medicines or behavioral interventions. And 
as I mentioned, I'm not sure it's something you would want to intervene on if it's that person's coping skill. On the other hand, ticks um, do have some positive um, response to, to medications and also to treatments um, like habit reversal. Okay, OCD and autism, also a super tricky um, differential. Um, and so I think, you know, when you're looking at someone who might have OCD or might have autism, um, you can look at the topic of the obsessions. So there tend to be very sort of classic obsessions in autism and classic obsessions in OCD, and they're pretty different. So in autism, um, obsessions with fears of aggression, obsessions of surrounding um, sex, um, surrounding cleanliness, safety, symmetry. Um, whereas in autism, you see a lot of hoarding of specific, um, of specific items or needing to know a lot about a specific topic, like needing to know the cars that everybody drives, um, even, even strangers. Um, again, people with autism like their obsessions. They don't find it you know, intrusive or unwelcome, whereas people with OCD tend to find their um, obsessions to be unwelcome. Um, and then the compulsions in OCD often follow logically from those obsessions. So someone that is obsessed with um, becoming sick is going to clean a lot. Um, and then even like some of the more magical thinking still follow logically. So someone that's obsessed with their safety might count in order to keep themselves safe. There is in their mind a logical connection. Whereas in autism, um, the compulsions like repeating things, putting things in order, touching things in a certain way are usually unrelated to the obsessions and they're usually um, pretty, pretty pleasurable for that person. So I mentioned earlier that sometimes it's not either or, but it's both. Um, and so people with autism um, have anywhere from a 69 to 79% lifetime risk of having a comorbidity. And I put some of the more common ones. 85% um, of people with autism at some point will have irritability, tantrums, or self-injury. 50 to 80% have sleep disorders. I mean, that's, that's a lot at some point in their lives. The number for ADHD is shockingly low. And the problem with these um, that I have 37 to 40%, I think, you know, I know in our CDC research, we found closer to 80%. It depends a lot on how they ask the questions and kind of what data set you're looking at. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about how we assess and diagnose autism um, in young kids. And now I wanna talk about, I'm gonna go through sort of how we, um, a systematic approach to psychiatric management and then um, evidence-based treatments. Um, so um, I found this a practice pathway um, in pediatrics from 2016 that I found to be incredibly helpful. and I. No, you can't read that slide, so I'm going to go through everything, but I just wanted you to know where this comes from. Um, so when a family with a child with, you know, school-aged children with a school-aged child with autism comes to you um, for help, the first thing you're going to do is address the crisis, right? They're coming to you because things are bad. Um, and so I think the, before you can do anything else, you have to focus on crisis management. And with kids with autism, one of the biggest shifts that you can help families do is, is understanding that crisis management begins at the first sign of escalation. So we're not talking about, you know, the person is at the point where they're locked in the room and threatening to hurt themselves. We're talking about the very first sign of escalation, and that's when that crisis management plan comes into place. Um, and I've even seen this in um, behavior intervention plans um, where the crisis is defined very far down the road where it's basically impossible to intervene at that point where things are so escalated. I also think another kind of shift for some families is considering whether the parent needs individual therapy, focusing on remaining calm in a crisis. So I've seen a number of, um, of parents who become so upset themselves um, when their child is distressed that they can't effectively help their child and avoid the crisis from happening. 
Um, obviously, you know, the kind of end of that crisis management plan is going to be, a, a, you know, a visit to the emergency room. And so helping the family prepare, how are they going to get to the emergency room and, and what to expect there. Um, but the two preventative measures are having crisis management plans for the home and the community, having it posted, um, making sure that everybody in the family knows about it. Um, in the community, it could be something like making sure the family has a handicapped parking pass. A lot of crises happen from the time the child needs to get out of a place and into the car or into the car and into a place. Um, also having a box in the car that has the emergency supply of food and drinks and a change of clothes and calming items. A lot of crises are caused when clothes get unexpectedly wet and the person has so many sensory issues they can't stand to have them on. They're hungry. You know, we're not, none of us are, are at our best when we're hungry. Um, and, and that may be even worse for someone with autism. And then having information cards um, for bystanders or first responders. So um, when we're looking at, you know, when a child comes in for help, it's usually there are many things that need to be addressed. And so what we wanna do first is systematically assess all of the difficulties and determine where we're gonna start with treatment, right? Um, because we can't fix everything at once. We have no magic pills in, in no matter what profession we're in. Speech therapists don't have a magic pill, psychiatrists don't have a magic pill, psychologists don't have a magic pill. Um, and then um, this is a lesson that I learned um, from my wonderful colleague, um, Dr. Jane Charles, which is before you do anything else, make sure you've addressed the medical problems going on. So is the child in pain and they can't tell you? So even verbal kids with autism tend to have a lot of difficulty understanding internal cues. Um, and so that child might be literally green and about to throw up and you say to them, are you okay? Are you car sick? No, I'm fine. Um, just a lot of difficulty understanding their own internal cues and then difficulty communicating that to other people. Are there seizures going on? Have we addressed constipation, reflux, allergies, routine dental care? So many of my patients have incredible dental decay because they literally will not let anyone get into their mouth with a toothbrush. And that can cause pain, which can cause behavioral challenges. Have we checked their vision and hearing? You know, maybe their eyes are hurting because they can't see things. In adolescent girls, are we, are we addressing PMS is issues or anything to do with menstrual discomfort? And then I'm a huge believer in the impact of sleep on behavior. Um, you know, if you can do nothing else, I think evaluating and trying to get that family into a better sleep pattern is helpful for everyone. So once you've finished that assessment, the next step is, to address functional communication concerns, right? How is this person communicating? If this is a nonverbal person, do they have an augmentative communication device? If this is a verbal person, do they have the skills to communicate pain? Um, and that's something you can write into your IEP, medical communication skills. Um, looking at psychosocial stressors, what else is going on in this child's life? Um, so often we look to fixing the child in a, in a um, in a situation that is broken, right? It, this is not, this is fixing the child's not going to help if the child's in a situation that they're experiencing maltreatment or they're being exposed to violence or stress. Um, also looking at their environment. Are there things going on in their environment that are making these behavioral challenges more likely to happen? Are we accidentally reinforcing negative behaviors and ignoring positive behaviors? Looking at the setting events, I mentioned before, is the child hungry at school? Are we asking them to do things that are beyond their skill level or have we missed a comorbid diagnosis? You know, if this child actually also has a reading disability or also has ADHD and we're not addressing those concerns, then, um, then we're kind of setting the child up for, um, for difficulties. Okay, so that's... Um, kind of when a child comes in with difficulties, how we kind of systematically assess them. And now I'm gonna talk about our two main treatment modalities, which are medications and, um, and behavioral treatments. So let's start with pharmacotherapy, medications for school-aged kids. 
Um, about 50% of school age kids with autism are prescribed psychotropics in any given year. Um, and that's compared to about seven and a half percent in the general peds population. Um, and the most common are ADHD medicines and out of those about two thirds are stimulants. Um, about 20% in any given year. So out of that 50%, about 20% are gonna be on antipsychotics, 17 on antidepressants, and just stay tuned for the um, data on that. Um, mood stabilizers, benzos, anti-anxiety and hypnotics, very much, um, much more rare, but still used. Um, you've probably heard this before. There are no treatments for the core symptoms of autism. There are several that are in early stages of testing, although I have not heard of any that are super promising. Um, I will say it's interesting, you know, most of you know that risperidone and aripiprazole, um, the um, Abil that's Abilify and Risperdal are approved for irritability, but there's also some evidence that they might um, dis decrease lethargy, social withdrawal, hyperactivity, stereotype movements, and obsessive behaviors. And if that's true, we're getting closer to treatment of core symptoms, right? The problem with these drugs is that, um, you know, the side effects are very significant. And so one of the most troubling side effects is the weight gain. We know that once people have gained weight, it is very difficult to help them lose weight. And so, you know, putting them on one of these drugs that is a, you know, associated with weight gain is a, it's a weighty decision. Okay, so let's look at the evidence. Um, first of all, I mentioned before um, how common SSRIs are, and I'll tell you the evidence, you guys, is so limited. Um, so there's a little bit of evidence for SSIs reducing repetitive behaviors in adults, very limited success in kids, and it's been, it's been tried. Anxiety, OCD, um, not a ton of evidence. There's been no rigorous trials of SSRIs for depression and ASD. I think that's what it, the most common sort of use is um, in the real world. And um, it seems reasonable since there is some okay support for using SSRIs in typically developing children. The methylphenidate products, the, the stimulants, um, really, um, really effective for ADHD symptoms in kids with autism. But interestingly, kids with autism seem to um, not respond as robustly as other kids, and they seem to have greater side effects. So I think, you know, the message is just, you know, like any other kid, you're going to start low, go slow um, to avoid some of those scarier side effects that really scare people off of the methylphenidate products. Um, Atomoxetine, as well as the um, alpha-2 um, agonists like clonidine and guanfacine, those work as well as methylphenidate for the hyperactivity symptoms, but they don't have great um, efficacy with the other sort of executive functioning and attention symptoms that the methylphenidate products are going to help with. And then um, interestingly, mel melatonin does have um, does have some nice um, evidence support for improving sleep duration and onset, um, and that it, um, melatonin can be even more effective when you add cognitive behavior therapy to it. Um, so this is the, um, in 2019, the British Association for Psychopharm made these consensus recommendations based on the available data. So it's interesting, SSRI is still the, you know, number one um, choice for mood and anxiety, and I think part of that is we don't have much else, right? And the safety data is really good. You know, good old plain old Prozac, it's been around forever. There's lots of safety data associated with it. Um, sleep, melatonin with the CBT, irritability. Obviously, we're going to start with the behavioral interventions and then move on to risperidone or aripiprazole. And then ADHD, first line treatment would be the methylphenidate, followed by the other choices. And I think with ADHD, it depends a lot on what you're trying to treat. If you're just trying to treat the hyperactivity, then it doesn't matter as much. But if you're really trying to get at those core attention symptoms, then um, the, methyl the methylphenidate is gonna be your way to go. 
Um, so I mentioned before that there are some up and coming choices um, where they're hoping to um, treat some of the more core symptoms of autism. Nothing looking very good so far, um, but you know, certainly that doesn't, um, people are still trying. Okay, the evidence base for non-pharmacological treatments. These are the treatments that have um, been di that have been um, indicated as evidence based by the National Autism Center and by AHRQ reviews. And the stars are ones that are overlapping between both of those. Um, and so I'm not going to have time to go through all of them. I'm going to be talking about behavioral interventions, um, cognitive behavior treatment, and social skills. But you know. Obviously, applied behavior analysis, um, comprehensive behavior treatment for young children has a lot of support, as well as the other kind of, I think of them as going along with ABA, the naturalistic teaching strategies, natural language kind of stuff, PRT, pivotal response training, where I got my start in autism, um, the parent training, um, a lot of these sort of fall under the larger umbrella, umbrella of applied behavior analysis. Um, story-based interventions like social stories um, is another really good one that doesn't sort of fall under that umbrella completely. Um, but I want to just highlight um, these three really quickly. Um, so cognitive behavior therapy, there is overwhelming support that CBT can be helpful for school-aged children with anxiety and autism. Um, tends to work best in those kids with sort of average IQ and language skills. And really not a ton of modifications have to be made to traditional CBT programs for anxiety um, in order to make it effective for kids with autism. I think our biggest challenge is just getting community providers um, to understand that they have the skills to work with these kids. Um, a lot of them are like, oh, I don't do autism. But if you, if you can do CBT for anxiety, you can probably do CBT for anxiety in autism. Um, the modifications that are made tend to focus more on the behavioral side than the cognitive side. Um, and then they tend to include the family more and for longer than you would with typically developing children who have anxiety. Um, social skills interventions like peers um, are very effective. Um, the, the problem is that um, generalization is not great and uh, we don't know how long lasting these interventions are. Um, behavioral interventions, um, there have been over 450 studies looking at the individual behavioral approaches to the treatment of autism. And what the behavioral interventions have contributed it are techniques for both improving skills, like building social skills and language, as well as techniques for decreasing problem behaviors. One of um, the techniques that we have contributed to the autism world that I think is incredibly powerful is the functional behavior assessment, which most of you are already familiar with. Um, so in an FBA, the approach assumes that behavior happens for a reason. And this is so critical because I think in autism, we often think that um, behavior just happens out of nowhere because it feels that way. Um, but a functional behavior assessment helps us to determine what the reason for the behavior is, and then that leads to a logical intervention plan. And so I'll just go through this really quickly. If we have a child who engages in yelling and profanity after receiving instructions and is typically removed from class, then we might hypothesize that yelling and profanity um, are um, a way for them to escape demands. And once we know that, then our behavioral intervention plan is very logical. Like, are our instructions too hard? Are we you know, making too many demands on this child? Can we visually pair demands with prepared tasks? Can we teach the child to make break requests? There's so many things we can do once we know the reason for the behavior. But if you think a behavior is happening out of nowhere or that has some sort of biological origin, then it leads you to feel incredibly powerless to intervene. Okay, four minutes to get through CAM treatments, and then I will take questions. Um, so, you know, there are so many complementary and alternative treatments out there for autism. And I think, you know, part of the reason is that um, the 
you know, sort of empirically supported treatments for autism are hard and they're expensive and they take a long time. And so, of course, and they don't work for everyone or they don't work perfectly. And so I think, of course, people are going to be looking for alternatives. Um, and most of them are not dangerous. I underlined hyperbaric oxygen treatments and chelation because they can definitely be dangerous. Medical marijuana um, debated, can debate whether it's dangerous or not. There are studies underway looking at it. Um, there was a review um, in 2017 that showed some emerging evidence for music therapy, sensory integration, acupuncture, and massage. Um, they weren't, there wasn't enough to call them established treatments, but um, there was some kind of nice, um, nice data there. Um, I think what's important for us to know is that um, more than a quarter of our families are using CAM treatments. They just are. And they often report not telling their doctors that they're using um, those CAM treatments. So it's really important that we as providers ask them and that we don't punish the family for being honest, that we have a dialogue with them um, and support their decisions um, for their child. Um, and I think, you know, one thing that we need to remember as scientists, those of us on here that are scientists, is that anecdotes are so much more salient than research. So just telling a family, well, there's no data to support that, that is not helpful because online they're reading anecdotes from people who tried that exact treatment and they feel that it was really helpful for them. So I think we need to feel comfortable sharing our experiences and saying, there's no data to support that. And here are my concerns. You know, I've seen patients that have tried this diet whose children already have very limited diets and it's caused, you know, X, Y, and Z problem. I think we need to feel comfortable sharing those anecdotes with our families. Um, you know, I think there's an attitude a lot among a lot of providers of like, oh, it just can't hurt. Um, but the problem is that there is a financial cost associated with any PM treatment. And there's also a time and energy cost. And it's not just that treatment, right? Because if that one doesn't work, the family's going to be on to the next one and the next one and the next one. So yes, maybe that treatment only costs $2,000. Well, what about the next treatment that comes along? And so what I'd like to do is help families become educated decision makers, have them conduct their own end of one studies where they change one factor at a time and keep objective data and commit to evaluating their child's response after a certain amount of time. Okay, got through a lot of stuff here and I really want to take the time to answer some questions. Um, so I don't know, David, do you want to kind of pull out some of the questions for me? I've got them all. Um, okay. so what we have here is several, a few different questions from folks. Um, and what we've been guided to start with the more broadly based ones first. Easy one is, is the PowerPoint going to be made available? I believe so. Okay. Cause I was told it's up to, um, um, the presenter. Okay. Um, okay. The next, yeah. what then, it, then the, I guess the answer is yes. Um, but they'll need to contact, they'll need to go through the um, Institute um, for Childhood Success site. Right. Um, what about the interface of cerebral palsy with rocking and headbanging and social deficits? So I think, you know, what you're getting at there is any one symptom doesn't make autism. So you can be a super picky eater and not want your food to touch. And that doesn't make you have autism. And so a person with cerebral palsy who has repetitive movements, if that's the only symptom, then no, they don't have autism. But if they have those repetitive movements and they also have difficulty reading nonverbal cues and they have poor eye contact and they have a lot of the other symptoms, it's that whole constellation of symptoms that creates the autism. <clears throat> Thank you. Hold on, my file just went behind the screen. Um, there's someone who is asking, they uh, work in a daycare and there's a 31th month old who meets most of the criteria for ASD. And she's wondering, he or she is wondering, can you offer any suggestions on guides to work with this child? Um, especially since um, she's nonverbal and doesn't respond to the requests of staff. Yeah, 
Um, so first of all, I, you know, I read that question and the person said this was young to be diagnosed. I, it is not young. Um, in fact, it's to me too old. Um, you know, we can diagnose autism in kids as young as 14, 15 months of age. So I think as a daycare provider, providing honest feedback to the family about your concerns and encouraging them to get an evaluation is critical because from the day that the family has concerns to the day that they actually get a diagnosis and get into treatment, it can be a really, really long time. Um, so the best thing that you can do is, is help that family get, you know, get to a doctor, suggest they talk to their primary care pediatrician and, and get an evaluation so that they can get intensive behavioral interventions. There's another question that says, uh, when you have first time parents and they have limited medical knowledge and find out their child has an autism diagnosis, what would be your first recommendation to those parents? So um, I love the Autism Navigator website. They have a, um, they have a like kind of introduction to autism um, program that's free. And it shows that the family like typically developing kids and kids with autism. And so when I have those parents who are pretty naive to autism and, and come in saying that nothing is wrong, I'll often say, go home and watch this and then come back and let's talk again. And in that interim, they're able to see a little bit more. Um, also, interestingly, in the pandemic, there's become a number of um, online parent training programs for autism available for free. Um, and I am happy to share that with the group. I don't exactly know how to do it, um, but um, you can find links to them on the Autism Speaks website under the um, COVID-19 section. Um, that's where I found them. And there's at least three really good parent training programs that at least for now, totally available for free. That's great. Um, the last question that we have looking as we have two minutes left. Um, well, we'll see. Um, <laughs> is what evaluation tools do you use in your clinic for assessment of autism? Yeah, so I, um, I love the ADOS, the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. It's really critical for me. And I wanna be clear that, you know, any autism expert doesn't need the ADOS. You don't have to have an ADOS in order to make an accurate diagnosis, but gosh, it sure is helpful. Um, it, and, and basically what the ADOS gives you is a standard way of observing behavior and coding that behavior. Um, and so that over time, when you see lots and lots of kids, you get to have a sense as to, how children respond to diff different, you know, approaches and presses. Um, and it's a really nice tool. But parent interview and teacher interview is also so critical because in our clinic, we see the child for such a short amount of time. Um, and we need to know how they're doing in all parts of their lives. So putting together our own observations as a clinician, along with parent and teacher information is really important. Need one second to get to a certain script. There are more questions, but we are out of time. So we want to thank you all for joining today. Um, just another reminder that if you're claiming the South Carolina Endeavors credit, just make sure you've completed that Google form that's in the box. Um, there will be a recording of this session um, that is made available to all attendees if you're interested in catching up on any of it. Um, that will be um, provided to you via email. Um, some next week. We want to thank you, Dr. Carpenter, for the excellent information, the answering of questions, and just a wonderful session. So thank you all very much. Um, this is where I turn it back to the tech monitor, who I believe will either just cut us off or remind us that we have a break um, for lunch and that the next session begins at 1230. So, thank and you I all very much. I wanted to say, if, if I didn't get to your question, please email me directly. There's not that many of you that we didn't get to, and I'm happy to answer any questions because normally we would be able to stand around and talk and we can't do that. So please email me. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>